we laugh, we cry, we learn, but really, what doesn't kill you makes you better at managing clients and everyone. I'm Morgan Friedman, and this is Client Horror Stories. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Client Horror Stories. I'm excited that today's guest is a little bit like Madonna and Jesus, only goes by a first name, Timmy. Timmy, (laughs) welcome, and what are you drinking today? Thank you so much, Morgan. That's maybe setting the expectations too high comparing me to Jesus and Madonna, but I try to live up to that. And I'm drinking white wine, a nice Spanish white wine. I'm enjoying the Spanish sunny days on the Canary Islands. So white wine it is for me. Cheers. What have you got? I've got some Valentin's whiskey today. <laughs> and, to, and to clarify, I meant to compare you to Madonna the singer, not Madonna, Jesus's mother. So uh, Okay, I, I was th- I was thinking of that. So I was like, okay, like where is this conversation going? Did I did I miss like <laughs> misunderstood the whole concept here <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm very excited to hear your client our stories and then figure out what lessons we can learn from it so others don't need to make the same mistakes that we did let's hopefully, hopefully. Well, well i'm sitting here not in the current era Islands, but i'm pretending i'm in a, a a forest let's jump in and i'm excited to hear about your disaster Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's get this off my chest, this horror story. <laughs> get it out there. Yeah. <laughs> so is it good? Whisk is good, so, right? It's not too cold, not too warm. It is it is the it is the, the perfect temperature. I think I need to optimize the setup so, so I'll do the next podcast from uh uh, uh from the actual jungle behind me. <laughs> that would not be bad, pretty funny. Bad. <laughs> so so let's so let's jump in right to right to the story. Uh, let's start from the beginning. I'm all ears. Yeah, good. So this happened back uh, in uh, sort of early 2020. That's when I I started my own business, and uh, you know I was in that startup phase. I was saying yes to everyone. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to have as many clients as I possibly could. So I wanted to build up my portfolio and also to gain more experience in running my own business and running my own clients. So what happened is that one of my friends, a really close friend of mine, heard about what I was doing and he actually needed someone to to help him with his branding and his marketing and the whole bunch that comes with building an entire business. And I had this little voice in the back of my head telling me that don't work with a friend of yours, like don't do this, this is not going to go well. But having that sort of phase in my life, in my business, not having enough customers at the very beginning, I said, okay, let's just roll with it, see what happened, what could go wrong? Right? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? So wait, let's let's pause there and talk about that for a second. I think this concept of the voice in your head is really interesting because so often the voice actually knows better than we know consciously. Yep. And and it's it's but the interesting thing for me is it's surprisingly hard for people to actually listen to the to even uh, hear it. Yeah, it's not even to <laughs> listen to the voice. But to even hear that voice right. until That's it right. starts screaming at you when you keep repeating the same mistakes, then you hear it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, since then, I learned, I learned that. I learned it the hard way. And it's not just that, but I'm always trying to be a bit more intuitive in what I do. So I try not to always rely on just logic and using my rational mind. Hence, that's what I'm working with in the spiritual industry, because this is quite acceptable to be more intuitive. But it's still, sometimes these things still pop up when your sort of rational mind takes over and you still are going to go down a different path versus what your, that little voice is telling you internally. So yeah, completely agree with you. I, I think that's a good point. The way I would reframe your same point is that there are a lot of things that we just don't know the patterns to, but like we, like we recognize there's a pattern, but we don't have the language in our head to be able to articulate it. So, yeah. so what, and, and I think the role in the human body of the voice in the back of your head is when you subconsciously notice the patterns and things are wrong, 
but you haven't, you don't yet have a way to argue your mind for your for your mind to articulate it. So, exactly. so that that's that's what the voice does. And I think the challenge is a lot of people who see themselves as rational and logical, they look for the clear logical argument and mm-hmm. articulation. So, so, but the little voice not having that is, uh, it, it makes it very easy for logical people to ignore it. Exactly. And it's just like understanding your own translation process, as you're saying, that maybe you, you realize some patterns and you realize certain things are maybe just, they just keep repeating in your business or in your personal life, doesn't matter where that happens. But if, especially if it does happen in your business life, especially with your clients, then something is going wrong and you're not paying attention to that little voice inside your head. <laughs> and by the way, I have seen all the episodes I've done so far, the little voice has like never really come up, maybe like a oh, really? passing here, here, here and there, but like, like I've never, never thought about it before. So like I was trying to get at least one new lesson per episode. Yes. So <laughs> at, at least we can go retire on the beach or the Canary Islands right, right now. So but, we can finish the episode now. That's all you yeah, want to right? Yeah, finish the episode. We don't even need <laughs> We're to hear done. the story. <laughs> cool story. <laughs> no, but, but I, I do think this is, a, this is an, an important point that in our desire to be logical and data-driven, that, it's, that our instinct as logically data-driven people is to ignore the little voice, but there's actually wisdom there. And the wisdom isn't in this spiritual sort of way. It's more just that your mind hasn't yet logically explained the pattern that your subconscious is putting together. So listen to that voice. It's like a machine, basically. All the data that you feed into your brain over the years, like we're not that like special or not that difficult to decode as human (laughs) beings. Like if you understand how to use your brain, you can actually use it to your advantage. So all this data is being sort of thrown at your brain over like 10, 15, 50 or 100 years, whatever is your current age. And then when you're in that situation, when you have to make a decision, do I use my logic or do I actually take a step back and let me see what comes up inside my head and what is that internal voice telling me? Because that internal voice is, as you mentioned, all these things that have been stored in this zillion little boxes inside your brain. What does the machine throw out? Analyzing that thing in there that you have all that in data that you inputted into your brain and then it will generate a result. And that is your sort of inner voice, your gut feeling, you know, that intuition and all of that. So love it. Not, okay. It's not so magic. Your voice... It's not magic. Sorry, sorry to sorry to ruin this for people who are highly I'm highly spiritual as well, but spirituality is not magic as a lot of science to it. <laughs> yeah. I I'm I'm totally on board. I'm totally on board. Um, <laughs> it's different words for expressing the same sorts of concepts. Absolutely. Absolutely like that. Okay. So now we're not going to end the episode here, but instead actually hear the story. So, <laughs> yeah. so you heard this voice work, working with a friend, but you, yep. you, you would, did it anyway. Completely ignore that little voice. So that was my first sort of mistake and my first lesson because I love making mistakes. Call me crazy, but I love making mistakes because that's how I can develop and, and correct right. things and do things differently. And I think when you, people start looking at mistakes from that perspective, they can really teach you a lot. So that was my first mistake there and then, not listening to that inner voice. So that what happened, we started kicking off the project and the deeper we were going into it, more and more these bumps were coming up in the road, like from the crazy bits to the stressful ones to the uncomfortable ones. So I went a full circle with this client and all of the potential things that could go wrong with the project itself, it went wrong, everything. And even things that were out of my control. So... (laughs) So I think a lot of power of these stories comes out from the specific details. So, yeah. so, it, so knowing that everything went wrong, like tell us about <laughs> three of the bit of the biggest things. The, the biggest, biggest thing. I've got a lot, and I, I'm going to be leading you all of them as well, so that you can understand like what were things were, what are the things that were happening, and, and maybe some of you out there can also relate to a few of them, or maybe you can learn from my mistakes and not make them. That's the whole aim of having this conversation. But the biggest issue that I had is that this client, as I said, the friend of mine that I said yes to, he needed a full branding concept for a brand new company that he wanted to build. So I was getting involved with coming up with the whole branding angle, the name, the colors, the logo, the website, all the whole lot that comes with it. But when it came to the developing the website, I was outsourcing that part, the development part of the work, because I'm not a developer. Like 
I'm not that kind of techie kind of person. I love coming up with concepts, but I outsource this kind of work to someone. So I came across this amazing contractor. I was super happy with his portfolio, his attitude, we, we clicks really well, character-wise as well. I was happy with his pricing. Everything seemed great. I'm like, perfect. I found the developer of the century. I'm so happy. Oh, hold on, hold on. I want to pause. There's yeah. another, another risk factor here, which is there's no such thing as a freelance. If something is too good to be true, it's probably not true. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so already if, if like if someone doesn't have any imperfections what that actually means is there are imperfections you're just not seeing them you're so spot on on that as well because that imperfection that came up was quite a big one actually so I, I later realized why everything seemed so great initially because what happened after that's when I everything clicked in my mind and that's when that little voice again came back to me saying like how did you not see this coming? This was so obvious. And then looking back, I realized the signs that were leading up to it. So I tried to keep this one short because I could talk about just this one hiccup for hours, but this amazing developer who was actually really good at what he was doing, he suddenly disappeared. He stopped replying to uh, my emails. He wouldn't pick up uh -oh. my phones. You know, uh -oh. the typical signs of... Yeah, just going literally into oblivion and not, and somewhere disappeared in a big void somehow, like completely couldn't get hold of them. At the same time, I obviously had a deadline with my client to deliver the website, which was not even like, not even half done. I just had the concept. I knew the delivery date. Everything seemed, you know, to be on track timeline wise until this guy completely disappeared. So it took me about a good two weeks and a lot of, a lot of stressful days and nights, as you can imagine, trying to find a replacement, finding out what happened. Turns out this guy had a bit of an existential crisis. We we're having a lot of those conversations about his self-awareness, what's his purpose in life, because we really click character-wise, but it kind of let him down that path when he just had a breakdown, com a complete breakdown, and he just had to shut everything out in his entire life. So I respect that, and I'm not going to be pushing if that's happening because your mental health is obviously a lot more important than any project out there but it was having such a sort of bad negative impact on the entire situation I was dealing with, not just for me, but also it also damaged my credibility and my trustworthiness with the client because that was one of the reasons as well that he was expecting of me that we worked together before when we were working in the same company many years before. So he knew that my top quality is being reliable and being trustworthy. So when these things happened that were completely out of my control, and I was late with delivering the website, obviously it undermined my credibility and my trustworthiness straight away. So that was the smallest hiccup along the journey. <laughs> so so let's, let's talk about that one. A few thoughts on that. First, yeah. one common pattern among the Kind Heart Stories episodes is probably, if I, if I have to say the one most important lesson I would give to anyone is that not communicating about a problem is almost always worse than the problem itself. So yeah. if you have an existential crisis so you can't work, like it's, it's actually perfectly fine because for the reasons you said, you're human and you have to figure out your existence as long as you tell us so that, uh, so that if they tell you, then, then instead of you losing those two weeks, you could have immediately gotten into pro problem-solving mode. So the problem exactly. isn't that even of the crisis is that he didn't communicate about it when it happened it was a complete lack of information because you know you cannot just make assumptions as well especially when you are in the middle of a project already and you're not going to be managing things just by assuming that the other person will show up or understanding even what's happening with them so had this person had told me as soon as he realized these things and i actually could have realized it because throughout our conversations these things kept coming up that even though we were supposed to be having a quick check-in session about the project itself, we would have ended up uh, having a much longer chat about what's going on in his life and the issues he had and uh, all of these, these things that were obviously coming with his crisis. And I could have probably picked on it as well and asked him there and then. So that was another thing as well. And what that taught me personally is that to always look at what's happening in the person's life, if, especially if I'm outsourcing something to someone, and I really, I really actually prioritize personal life over working 
which maybe is not the most long term. I think in the long term, it's actually a lot more efficient for the business as well than for the short term. But not many people and not many businesses would do that. They look at quick profit, let's deliver the project and it's done. I would much prefer to work with someone that I know they are in the right frame of mind, everything is okay and going well, because that's how they can go and over and beyond what's expected of them. So that was my big lesson there to check in with the person before I start working with them as well. Like, how's everything? What's going on with you? So, so I, I think that's a great lesson. What I would add to that is just overanalyzing this little, this little detail is the yeah. following. The, one of the, probably the single biggest difference that big companies offer as opposed to small companies, like the one man software development or the five software developer friends as opposed to the software development firm with a thousand employees, for example, or the one lawyer versus a huge law firm is mm -hmm. continuity. Because, and what I mean by that is in, and I like that you're taking a swig of wine, we need to get drunk <laughs> with this. Um, and what I mean by that is with any small company, there's always the risk at any moment that the company collapses. That, and it could be a one person that has an excuse or breakdown, or it could be three partners and they have a fight among themselves for whatever business reason. I like I years years ago, I ran I ran a company with me and my my partner, a software developer, and he died in a car crash. So um, and so it's like people die. Speaking of spirituality and the, and the, and the importance of of life, much uh, much more than work. But the exactly. key difference that big companies have as well though, is the big company have these processes and these people and they have extra people sitting there, other people watching it, so that when any individual you know, has a breakdown or leaves or quits, there's this yep. instant continuity um, as well. And that's a core reason why big companies are able to charge five or 10 times or more. What smaller what small companies can charge? I, I completely get that. I used to work with big corporate companies as well. And one of the tasks that I was doing with them is setting up the processes in the one best way format so that if someone would, you know, like one, one cog of the machine would go out, then you can easily replace it with someone else and cross killing people. But when you are starting your own business or when you are a self-employed person dealing with all of your administration, getting your clients, your marketing, your sales, or the finance, all of that stuff, especially at the beginning, you simply don't have that, not even luxury, I want to say luxury, but it shouldn't be a luxury, you know, that's the thing, like it should be the standard to have your right-hand person, to have another person to delegate to and start bringing these people into the, into the system because that what happens, what if you are the one who has a breakdown? It could happen as well, you know? <laughs> what if you suddenly wake up and you're like, actually, is this the business I want to be running? And that what happens? <laughs> why, why do I exist? Do I even exist? He's like, is um, it even like real? What's happening? <laughs> so yeah, that, that could also happen. So with, with this guy, I, I really felt for him, but at the same time, I got also upset and I brought a lot of emotion into the whole thing, which I, again, maybe wasn't the best thing to do. The reason why I got upset personally is because of what you were just explaining to me, like not having that information of what was happening. I could have easily come up with a solution. I could have easily said, okay, I wish you all the best. Let's catch up when you are feeling better. And, and that's it. Instead, he ended up wasting my time and wasting the client's time as well. In the end, I had to look for an alternative, which also meant with a very short notice period, finding reliable developers is not that easy. You probably know this being in that, in that sector previously yourself. So when I did find a, an alternative to replace the, this, this poor chap who was having this breakdown, I had to obviously pay extra for him to deliver things fast. So in the end, the, my sort of profit on that side of the project was non-existent because I prioritized the client's experience over my profit. And I said, okay, I already I'm, I'm delivering a bad experience here for the client because everything is delayed. He doesn't know what's happening. I don't have the information to tell him because no one was telling me what was happening. So I decided that's going to be a lot more important for me, for this client to walk away still with a, a good experience than me making a quick profit on that side of the project, which I still made healthy profit on the other side of things. But that's another call as well. So it also cost me financially as well, not just, you know, my right. time. By the way, I want to share two processes or two things that I do that help minimize the problem because mm -hmm. I'm a small company. It's 
me and a bunch of people that, uh, that work with me. Uh, I'm I'm not I I'm not Google I'm not Mr. Google. So as so as a result, to solve this, this continuity problem, there are two and and this broader communication information problem. Here are two tips. Neither of which I shared in an episode before. So uh, new information <laughs> out there. Um, first, the way I work with my teams is I insist on complete transparency on like every communication, everything. And, and we use a system that I'm in love with, Basecamp, that just yeah. we're all, every conversation is public, every document is public within the team that's working on that. And like, even if like you're working on a whatever, a Google presentation, like you do it in the shared Google Drive so everyone can see it with a stream of updates. So with one of the reasons why this is great is if someone disappears or has an existential crisis or stops working, you see instantly because you're just like, wait, none of the docs that he was working on have been updated since such and such date. So it basically gives you, so rather than saying, oh, I'll wait a few days until I contact him, you see immediately, wait, wait, nothing, there's been zero action, which you can only see that if you have transparency into this stream of activity. Um, Second second thing I practice is, or that that I do, is um, for all the different positions and work and, and, and everyone and, and any tire. I think except for my videographer who's gonna edit this so high. <laughs> except for her, everyone else, I have, I have a bunch of different people doing the same job. So I have a few different writers, some you know, some write these articles, some write those articles, some write those articles, a few yeah. different web developers. So and and part of the power of that system is okay, if one one of them disappears, okay, I temporarily just give exactly. more work to the other two uh, until I until I find someone else someone else to, uh, to replace that one. So it, it 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 makes it much easier. And by the way, I dealt this, I, I dealt with so many people disappearing like this. I developed this system explicitly to like to prepare for avoid for having this. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, because it really is a stressful situation as well. And not only that. You know, it created all of these issues that I described, but on a personal level, it also started making me question my own ability as well. That why was I not in a position to, to be able to get this information out of him? Why did he feel that he couldn't share this information with me? So at the end of the day, it made me question my own self as well. That did I create an environment for him that he couldn't open up enough? Did I create you know, really hard expectations on him or what were the deadlines maybe too unrealistic for him. So I actually looked at it from that perspective as well to see and explore, was it me creating this situation because of my expectations maybe? And, and what conclusion did you come to? Like, did you, like are you now creating different types of It wasn't of me. It wasn't me. <laughs> I realized it wasn't me. In that scenario, <laughs> quoting Shaggy or what was his name, it wasn't me. <laughs> No, in that case specifically, you know, I'm always open to learning. And, and um, one of the things that I actually love doing when I work with either for my own business or before when I was managing teams at a sort of like director level position, I love creating those kind of environments when people can just be themselves, first of all, and they can speak up to anyone at any time. Because I always believe that when you create that environment in your work situation, that if someone has a better idea than you are or you are doing something wrong, like get the other person to speak up. That's the kind of env- environment that a business can thrive. And that's the kind of environment that clients and, and customers will have a good experience as well. Because if something is going wrong or if something could be done better that maybe I'm not seeing, I would like to know about it. And I'm going to praise that person for, this is great. Like, I like that you think better than I do. I like that you are better than I am. I don't have to be the one being good at everything just because I came up with the idea. Let's surround yourself with people who are better at you in certain things and let them have fun with their area of expertise. And then if you are a leader or a business owner or or have your own clients, your job is to run the whole thing and and have the vision and push things forward. But your job isn't to make sure that every single little piece of the system is working well enough. Have your people there, let them play with it. and as you mentioned, create that transparent environment, which now I have since that situation. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, so this was one problem. One. Software developer <laughs> disappeared. 
Now tell us a different thing that that went wrong. I think that should have been my big clue to stop the project there and then. <laughs> I think, <laughs> but instead, I, no. <laughs> I think that I think that really just listens to your gut point. Your gut probably told you, or that yeah. voice in your head to stop the project, but. Um, no, I pushed. I, I kept on pushing it through. So when th- this thing happened, and then another bit that was happening, which I found really odd, um, I was only responsible for the branding, okay, and the marketing, as, as I explained earlier. And then one day, I, I kept getting these emails from the the team of the company to telling me that their email addresses are not set up and they're not working. And I was completely confused. What's happening? Like, why are they? asking me all these IT related questions. Like I have nothing to do with setting them up on their, on their email servers and, and this and that. And uh, it really got to the point that the client of mine, that friend of mine just ended up telling his team, contact Timmy, she will, she will help you with this. So I really lo- I didn't set those boundaries clearly for me to communicate it well enough to, the, to his team and, and to my client where my responsibility stops and where it ends because we were friends. I ended up taking going like, okay, happy with this, don't worry. I'll do that as well, don't worry. Yeah, of course, you can ask me these questions. Until it got to the point that I was getting these IT-related questions and that has nothing to do with me or marketing in general. And the, those guys in his team, they were getting a bit upset with me. Like, why is Timmy not helping us? Because that's what my client was telling them. Like, go and ask her. She will help you set up your email account. And I was like, no, I'm not. That's not anything to related to the, the task at hand. <laughs> Is that something that you came across Perfect. as well? Only uh, every day of my life. But um, <laughs> yeah, ba- like boundaries and expectations are important. So before I tell you some of my thoughts, my question for you is, how did you tell him? And like, how do you address that? And like, did you like, like because you, you could deal with that by saying, I'm doing more pay me more you could deal with that by saying hey here's the scope i like like this is this is out of scope so this is what, how, how did you do it the way i dealt with it i knew that i i don't enjoy personally getting involved with it related tasks so i could have gone down that route and just bring in and outsource this to someone else what i said i'm not going to to do this because it's not going to be good for me if i don't enjoy the job at hand it's going to you know trickle into the, the client's experience so what i did instead i actually recommended him a few people out there who specialize in, in these areas, in addition to sending them things that I, I found even online, just by Googling things like how to set this up on your email server, things like that. Like step, like they could have done it themselves, you know, but if it was a really odd situation. So I clearly explained to them that this unfortunately has nothing to do with my sort of scope here with the project. And, and it's not even marketing related. How do you set up your business email accounts that, you need to have someone in, in-house who's going to be you know, managing your networks, who is going to manage your email accounts and your, your, all of these things that come with it. So I think he ended up, I'm not sure what happened in the end, who he chose, but I, I nicely directed him into a different direction. But the strange thing was that I same issue happened. I was not getting the information from my client. Or same sort of a scenario that was happening with the, the developer guy. The information was not coming through. What was happening instead is his team directly started reaching out to me without the client telling me that, hey, don't be surprised if my guys are going to contact you. So right. that would have avoided the entire situation because what it caused for those people in his team, obviously they, they become frustrated because they didn't know that I wasn't the real person who's going to fix this problem for them. So it goes back down to lack of communication or miscommunication again could have been so easily, so easily avoided a situation like that. So why do you think your friend didn't tell you, hey, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna have some of my guys reach out to you about IT? Because of that boundary issue, that was very clear to me because I didn't say, said no to him before then. And it, there was a lot of like smaller bits as well leading up to this point. And I just kept saying yes, because out of respect that he's my friend, of course I can help you out. Okay, it's not part of the project, but let me see what I can do. So I was really supportive and and trying to be helpful, which was not creating a good situation at all because he was expecting something completely different than what was the actual setup. So that was definitely one of the lessons as well I learned here is that when I do work now with someone, they have very clear understanding of what is it that I can help them with, who's doing what. And if I don't know the answers or I'm not the right person, 
then they know who they have to go to. So these things do not happen again. It's just communication. A lot of the mistakes that you, you encounter in business could be easily avoided if people were you know, better or stronger communicators with each other. That's usually the key there, I think. So was this, was this one, I don't, I don't know this guy, so we can interpret it more or less cynically. If okay. we're not in a cynical mood, he didn't communicate, whatever. A more cynical interpretation, so perhaps this is the whiskey talking, is sometimes stronger parties take advantage of weaker, of yeah. weaker parties, saying, okay, I don't want to hire someone. She's helping out so much. She always wants to help. Why? Why not just and why not just give her this and this uh, and this? Like sometimes they push your boundaries on purpose. Yeah, that's exactly what was happening there because you know, and I can't blame him for that. You know, he's 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 smart in his own <laughs> own ways because it, it would have cost him like a lot less time to run this past me instead of like having to look out and look for someone else to do this. So I can't blame him for trying to do this at all. It just goes completely against my core values in general that I try not to push people too much. If I know like what is that we agreed on that, let's uh, stick to it and let's agree on uh, how things are fair. So it's interesting that like your friend was- uh, We're not was, friends was, anymore. Ah, <laughs> uh, now I see This whole happened. project, this whole project really had such a such a bad damage on our overall friendship that we didn't even speak for about a year after that it, it happened because we even ended the project early in the end we decided that let's just stop this because this is not working out at all and i should have done that when the developer actually had a breakdown so i wouldn't say that we're on bad terms it's just we don't really communicate that that often maybe like once or twice a year so for those people i, I wouldn't really call them friends anymore it's just people i used to be friends with or people that i i know but um, this, this one of the other lessons as well, going back to the very beginning, is when you decide to, to take a friend on as a client, expect that your dynamic will change within the friendship because one of you is going to be over and, and below the other person because either you're the client or the contractor or, or the other way around, the dynamics will change and that could trickle into your day-to-day -day friendship as well if you're not in a position to fully separate it, which many people are not that it's not even wise, I'm not even sure what the right word is here, skilled maybe or, or talented, to completely separate your friendship away from your business project. So I think that could be quite difficult to, to master that. I don't want to do that anymore. I, rea I realize that it's not a good combination. Like rather not just keep friends for friends and let's just have friend fun with them and let's do business with people that are my clients and let's not mix these th do, do things together because it doesn't lead down a, a happy path or a fun path even if things do go wrong but yeah you're right that it was a bit of a power play there yeah so what's powerful about working with friends is you see their strengths and their weaknesses mm -hmm. on another level um yeah. i think i would make a stronger version of your argument where it's not that you don't necessarily want to work with them or it's and it's not that be prepared for the dynamics to change. It's just, you have to be prepared to lose that friend. So yeah. I think the question is always, is this project more important than this friendship? And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer. Sometimes, because like the levels of friends, sometimes someone's like, oh, an acquaintance you kind of know from the party scene. So like, exactly. yeah. like if he ends up being incompetent and you lose that friend, it, it, like, as opposed to this big project, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. On the other hand, if it's your best friend since childhood, you might want to interpret yeah, it. You might want to double think. And it doesn't mean as well either that every single time you do end up working or taking your friend on as a client, this will happen. It, this was my case. And, and I've actually heard from other people as well, similar kind of stories since this happened to me. So I know that it's probably is going to be more likely to happen than not likely to happen. Maybe that's what it is. But it's a different story if you partner together with a friend and you two are on the same level and maybe you are running a business together, but you have different functions. That can work really well because if you know, each, especially when you know each other's strengths, what you mentioned earlier as well, you can know how to leave the other person just be and do their own thing. The, the dynamic really shifts when one of you is above the other one and then you have that sort of expectation of the other person 
client versus the person who's paying the client, you know, like all of these things. So that's when I think things can shift a little bit. And um, if things go wrong, yeah, as you said, just be prepared to, to say goodbye to that friend if the project is more important for you. But nowadays I choose people over projects and, and it's so far it's working out pretty well for me. <laughs> I would add to that that it's not clear to me that it might be less risky if you're a business partner as opposed to a vendor contractor. Mm-hmm. Because I think in the vendor relationship, it's actually really easy to end. You just like, what if he says, hey, it didn't work out. You pay them what you need to pay them. And like, they, it's, it's actually really easy to end. But when it's a partner, what happens? Someone has 50% of the equity. What happens when they're underperforming, going on vacation? Like, it's much, much harder to, yeah. uh, to, uh, to, to, kick out, to kick out a partner. And it's also harder to objectively judge a partner as well. Because a partner, you expect to do all these very different things while the vendor just just make us a logo and, and that's it. Yeah, you're, you're actually covering some good angles there as well. So maybe I haven't maybe explained my point of view <laughs> well enough, but I, I completely see where you're coming from as well. What I meant is more the, the likeliness of these issues to come out when you have these shifted dynamics, because if you are going to have an issue, it doesn't matter what level you are within the business, the issue is going to happen. And yes, your friendship will have, you know, will be impacted. The, the likeliness of these things happening, I think they come out a lot more often. For example, maybe you work in the same company and your line manager is your friend as well. Those things will have a little impact at right, work. Right. You know, that's what I mean. So when one of you is above the other person in, in the hierarchy of the business, these things could really come in a, a lot more often or a lot, not even often, but it's a lot more likely. I think that's the proper sort of situation here. It's a lot more likely that these things come up and, and these dynamic issues could come to the surface versus if you two are having the same level of authority and the same level of responsibility. If things go wrong, yes, it's still uncomfortable. And then absolutely I'm with you that if things go wrong, it's going to be a lot more difficult to part ways if you are both partners, 100%. Yeah, I agree that that makes sense. There's an old saying in English, which is good fences make good neighbors. And and I think it's a useful phrase to remember when you're good, like when you want to work with your neighbor. Like yeah. like there's a fence, hey, I do what's on this side, you do what's on this side. That is a really good way to minimize these sorts of risks. Mm-hmm. So something I've friends that I've gotten into business with. Hey, I have the final to say, I have the final say on marketing. You have the, yeah. you have the final say on product. And like just a, a very- um, a, Expectations a very- again, right? Like clear boundaries, clear expectations, and then communicating between each other. That's, I think those things can really eliminate problems from even arising when you have- oh, I, I, very- I have a question. Why do you think that so many people don't set clear expectations and clear and clear boundaries? Because I, I I agree with your point that yeah. setting clear expectations and boundaries would solve so many of these problems. But why doesn't everyone do that? What do you think? I think it comes down to self confidence initially because for you to be able to speak up and tell people like, okay, this is where my work stops. This is what you can expect of me. That takes a certain um, level of, uh, of confidence and, and, and determination as a person. And for you to be able to, to present that level of confidence, you need to be completely self-aware about your strengths and be able to also aware about what can go wrong and what are my weaknesses. So I'm not going to take on roles or activities or projects that are going to be risking my weaknesses coming out. So I think it really trickles down to understanding yourself in the business and your character as well. Can I confidently say that this is what, where the sort of project ends or this is where my tasks would end? If not, then why not? Why am I not speaking up? If things are going wrong, why am I just keep taking on more work or why am I keep dealing with this client? And just listening back to some of your previous episodes as well, clearly many of us out there having this uh, sort of not setting enough boundaries because if we at some point we would have told those crazy clients or they told those weird ones like, no, I'm not going to go into a shopping mall and build you a store, you know, like this sort of thing. So why are we not speaking up? I really believe it comes down to maybe one of the things, self-confidence and also maybe lose that, that 
fear of losing that project and that client, that's probably another big factor there, especially if you are, if your business is maybe quite early on and maybe you don't have that many clients or maybe you don't have enough revenue coming in, that could, in my case, that was the, one of the things. He was one of my first few clients. So I wanted to build up my portfolio. That was my main driver there. I said, okay, I know he's my friend. I shouldn't probably work with him. Should have listened to that voice, but it's going to be an amazing case study. It's going to be an amazing uh, sort of company to add to my portfolio. In my case, that's what I probably wasn't speaking up enough and why I kept on saying yes to all these strange things. But when someone maybe is worried about not uh, generating enough revenue in a quarter, in a month or in a year, that could be another reason why they don't speak up and they don't set clear boundaries because the risk is always there. How is the client going to react if I speak up? What is the client going to say? Do they just finish the contract early and they just drop me and then you know, I'm out of this client or what's going to happen. So I think it could be many, many reasons, but if I wish, I wish I had some data and that's my rational mind thinking because I love data as well. <laughs> I would love to dig into some data. So if anyone is listening to this and has some data, please share it with me. I would love to see that. Like what are the sort of top reasons that um, people would, wouldn't be standing up for themselves. I, if I had to bet on it, I would go with confidence, like lack of confidence or not enough confidence in your, in your own abilities to say no to someone. I'm not sure. What do you think? Which, which one of these? So, like the while, of- while, while listening to you, I developed a theory in my head. Oh, this, tell me. I'm curious. This, you need to drink some wine for this one. My theory is about two minutes old, which means it's likely utterly and completely wrong, but I'm going to share it anyway, knowing that my theory could be completely wrong. I, um, I think the whole modern world or modernity is all about breaking down batteries. Like when, like when you, when you think about it, I'm sure your grandparents, like I'm sure your grandparents were like, we're like this, but they're like that. And yeah. oh, those bad people over there, we don't like them. Everyone's grandparents have like have have their have their own version of that. And um, but in so many different ways, what it was like where where there were like the old world was all about offenses. This is there, that's that's on the that's on the other side of fence, and that's just how it goes. But in every possible way, the modern world is just like the pattern man, everything happening. Oh, there's this big question about immigration all over. Mm. What is immigration? There's this country, there's that country, and there's a border between them. Immigration is really just breaking, uh, breaking it down. It's 2022. The transgender yeah. stuff is a big issue. It used to be 100 years ago, man or woman. This, the modern world is breaking down the boundary between the soul and soul. So it's interesting thinking about it on this holistic way that if like if this theory is right and the modern world is about breaking down boundaries what's happening is what we're what the conclusion of our episode or where this where one of the points we're getting to is actually boundaries are good and you need to do them but if it's your whole life since you're a little kid everything and the media tv everyone around you is like no boundaries are bad boundaries are bad boundaries are bad what's going to happen is when you're in a business professional situation where it's actually a good moment to have a boundary you're going to be like, mm. subconsciously, that little voice in your head is going to be like, my whole life, everyone has been telling me boundaries are bad. So you're going to, you're going to feel bad about putting down a boundary and you won't want to, which is why you won't have that conversation. What do you That's think of this? Yeah, this is a really interesting theory. And uh, I could see it actually makes a lot of sense to me. So I think it probably has a lot of sort of subconscious sort of signaling to it and that's maybe why people would also do it so it probably is quite a complex thing so maybe it's a bit of what you're saying a little bit of what i'm saying and maybe and many other different things that we haven't and, even about yeah. and how all this come up and i also believe that it has to come down to that individual person who's in that situation and and why they are not you know having uh, clear expectations or, or setting the the right tone in a in a, in a more um, you know, like black and white men are like, this is what I do. That's what you do. Here we are. And that's it. So, yeah, I think I, I don't think it's a crazy theory. I, I see a lot of truth in there and why it could be coming into the business world. And, and also not a bit as well that could also influence this is that 
a lot of people out there, especially people who are driven to, to create something, those are the ones who usually start their businesses. The people who are ambitious, they have this drive in them that they want to create a legacy or they want to make an impact. Right. And, and if, if you are those kind of people and you are either working for yourself or you run your own business, then very likely that you're going to go through that phase when you think that, but I'm here to serve, you know, I'm here to serve my clients. I'm here to serve my community. My business is here to serve, I don't know, the environment, society, the world, whatever. So that could also come into play in addition to these other things that we mentioned, because you will have that thing again, like telling you that, but I need to serve the client. The client is always right. <laughs> I'm here to serve them. <laughs> so yeah, many different things. I would love to see statistics. <laughs> I'm still on that. <laughs> yeah, is there are, any? It's interesting. I think there are, but I think there are also variations of both your your analysis and my analysis. A very of, here's a variation of your analysis where so you're seeing a lot of people like self confidence. I also think it's an experience thing. Like, uh, like once you're 40, you've been doing this long enough, you know how it goes. So, so as, as, as a result, it becomes much easier to take. But when you're 20, you're just starting, you have yeah. like no idea what's supposed to happen, what's happening in a big professional world. So, so I think it's also just an experience thing, but I think it's, this is a variation of your confidence point. Because like confidence and age, like often go hand in hand. Absolutely, um, especially in your business age as well. And then I... You need to separate it as well because it depends on like how long have you been in business because that is your new age that's your new birthday when you start your own business right <laughs> because you're going to be going through the same development process with your business as you went through in your real life so when you were a child and you were you know like learning how to you know say no learning how to read and write you need to learn similar things in your business life like how do i recruit how do i find customers how do i pay my bills how do i all of those I, things. By the way, I never thought of this metaphor before, but I really like it. That like yeah. your business goes through different stages that could be mapped to the stages of growing yeah. up. It is. It is. Those, there are always examples when you see, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like the unicorn startups, for example, a different story. But if we talk about the sort of standard or average kind of business out there, that takes some time to grow and it's not just a massive spike in growth and the beginning and then they explode, but that sort of traditional, it grows, it stagnates a bit, it grows again, it stagnates and it grows and grows and then they explode in about a couple of two or three years, they go boom, right up and then they start scaling. So that's the kind of business I'm talking about. They do have those milestones in, and then you as a business owner or as a self-employed person, doesn't matter if you are a solo entrepreneur or if you are running an entire operations, it's the same process. You are going to be going through the same teething problems <laughs> as anyone else out there. So even though that people will listen to these episodes and they will learn a ton of those things like, okay, I, I need to make sure I don't do this. But then something else comes up that we haven't talked about here. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay, that's part of my journey and the beginning. And I said yes to a client that, I don't know, is not in line with my target audience instead of being a friend. It's going to be the same setup at the end because they're going to clash. There are going to be issues and mistakes, but in different format. So yeah, maybe we can back this out as well and compare it to like walking and then running and going to school and graduating. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it might be a fun article to write. We can yeah. uh, write yeah. the article over whiskey. Um, and why? Oh, so now, so now it started, it's, you heard the voice in the back of your head, you went to this project, everything that could go wrong went wrong. We deep dived into two of the specific examples now, how did the story end? I know, I know you're no longer friends, but like, was there a big fight? Like, what what ended up happening? Yeah, it was what it led before we. I came to the realization that I need to end this project. Before I came to that conclusion, I went through this phase internally as a person and as a business professional. I really it led me to to start questioning my own ability and my entire business. So I. I Full circle, quite funny. Like I ended up having a mini existential crisis that started uh. at the beginning, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I was there thinking like, 
I know I'm really good at what I'm doing and I'm doing this with, with passion and, and my intentions are right. And, and I have the skills, I have the knowledge and I love what I do. I enjoy what I'm doing. But all of these sort of bumps in the road that were happening and it's just the two major things that I mentioned there were like a zillion other things along the way. But all of these things were adding up and adding up until I got to the point when I started questioning myself. And then it, if it had an impact on me in my personal life as well. So I would feel demotivated and uh, I, would, I would start really sort of going downhill a little bit and start really questioning like, is this really what I want? Like, is it how this is going to work? Is this what this means having a business? Like maybe I don't want to deal with this. Maybe I don't want to have these many stressful days and nights and being up until midnight or one o'clock just to finish some quick task for, for this client, for example, the next morning, which he didn't actually end up use the next day. So yeah, these things. So yeah, I went through this phase internally when I was really questioning things and, and my abilities. And then I had to really force myself to take a step back and let's look at the situation from an external point of view, because I felt that because of the sort of my client being my friend, I wasn't thinking clearly. I didn't have clarity around the project itself. And I wanted to do a bit of a, an analysis and let's see like, okay, what happened from the moment the project started? What were the, the hiccups? Where were the problems? And then what could we have done to avoid this and how I could make sure that this doesn't happen again? So I had to literally remove myself from this process and look at it from externally. And that's when I realized that many of these things were really out of my control. And that's when I realized that even though these bumps came up, I handled them so well, like finding another developer so quickly who actually managed to deliver the project even better than the, how the first draft turned out. So looking like, it's always, you're always smarter in hindsight when you look back and you realize, okay, this is how things worked out. So that was my, my internal little crisis before I realized that, okay, this is not having a good impact on me. And, and I need to end this project because if I carry on with this project, it just feels really forced. It doesn't feel that I'm enjoying the process anymore. And that was the entire reason why I started my own business to have fun, you know, to, to make a living out of what I actually love doing. And very quickly, I ended up in a situation when I wasn't loving what I was doing. It wasn't a great scenario. So I decided I need to cut I need to cut this project. I need to clear this out of the way so I can focus on more aligned customers that I'm going to click with. And then they are not friends, but they are actual customers and we have a better dynamic. So the, the funniest thing, how this actually happened, this was on a Sunday. I was, um, I was having this decision in monologue in my, in my head. When I realized, okay, Monday morning, first thing I'm going to email him, let's set up a meeting and we close this and let's see where we are. And I recommend him someone else to, to work with. In the morning, I woke up around eight or nine. I'm about to write the email. I can see an email coming from him, literally as I'm typing the email to him, telling me the exact same thing. So for some magical reason, <laughs> we both ended up coming to the same conclusion. So even though that it had a negative impact on our friendship, we kind of still had that connection between us that we were still you know, on the same kind of wavelength because we, we knew each other so well. And I think we, we realized both of us that this was not working out and let's not force it anymore because it really had already a bad impact on our friendship. And we ended on good terms. So we had a nice conversation on the same day. And we, I told him my perspective. He told me his perspective. And we realized that things are just not working out and, and let's not do this. And then everything else was you know, uh, perfectly handled. So no pending payments, no pending uh, projects. So I delivered what was still pending. He settled the, the remaining invoices. So there were no issues there in the end. But it really had that bad feeling. It left that bad feeling in me. And also the fact that I started questioning my own ability, that was the biggest wake up call for me. And that's when I realized that this is not the project I need. If the, if the project makes you question your own abilities, something's wrong with that project, definitely. So. So, so that's interesting. I'm happy there's a happy ending, even though you're no longer friends. So it's as happy. Yeah. As as it, as it could have been. Um, I think I would say for myself, everyone's different for myself. I think there are healthy and unhealthy ways to question your own abilities. So, um, so I, I'm often in projects and situations where I question my own abilities and what I've often found is in the healthy ones. Like that's when, that's what forces you to up your game, to go to the next yeah. level. That's um, a different story, though. Yeah, 
that's a different story when you take stock of where you are and where you want to be. But when you are questioning those abilities that you are 100% sure that those are your strengths, that's when you realize that things are not right. So yeah, this, this was not, uh, I think, the greatest experience for me from that perspective, but that's exactly what I needed. And I'm so grateful that this actually happened, the entire thing with all the stressful, crazy moments and, and even the, the fact how it had an impact on my friendship because it taught me so many things that otherwise it would have taken me maybe two, three, five years to learn. And I learned this within six months of, of running that project and, and having to deal with those things. And, you know, it does make you question that what is it that I actually want moving forward? And that's what it also really helped me with to refine my audience a lot better and to create a much better customer avatar, knowing like who I would actually enjoy working with. And since that moment, I, I never had a bad customer or I never had a stressful customer. All of those people that I'm, I'm working with for the last nearly two years now, I, lo I love every moment of it. Like it can be like that sort of good kind of stress, but at the same time, I'm not having any of these conflicts or, or issues because I, I learned my lesson quite early on, which I am going to be always grateful for. So I think if, if anything I had to take away from the entire sort of project and experience, it was that, that it really accelerated my own growth in my business and my own like, personal growth, I mean, and also my own evolving on my skill set. As you mentioned, like sometimes you need to question your abilities that's what it did to me. It really brushed up on my existing skill set to, to take me one level up at that time. Yeah, we, um, you own, humans, I think, only grow with challenges. So mm -hmm. you need to be in these sort of hard situations to learn. Um, and I think the challenge is you want to, I think you always want to be in situations that are just difficult enough and above your level so that you learn. But if it's too much, then like that's when it's a true disaster a, a true disaster yeah exactly and i think as well like you, you know i don't know any business or any business owner who's never had a difficult or tough situation and it's just right. it's right. just what it is right i wish there was but that's not what business or life is even about but the difference is and the only thing that you as a business owner have control over is when these things happen when these challenges arise the only thing that you do have control over is how are you going to react in, in those situations are you going to react in a way that you get angry you get upset or frustrated and you just throw in the towel or you start having an argument with your contractors or or with your team or, or customers or do you take a step back and realize okay this is teaching me something let me see what I can do differently let me see why is this happening let me understand the other side why is the other side doing what's happening here and and, and what is the the root cause of the problem if you just do a simple root cause analysis, you can get to the bottom of things, which usually is miscommunication. <laughs> As we just to recap, no communication and no boundaries. So it's always it's always worth to just step outside think, of that scenario for a bit. I think it's great that you that you're like, if you do a simple root cause analysis, because when I try to do root cause analysis, it often goes to deep questions. Like you do all <laughs> yeah. the why, 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 why. why. It, like the last why always ends up with like why do I even exist and why yes. why am I here? <laughs> so it was going out and it actually so doing a root cause analysis actually causes these sorts of existential crises which mean which makes it hard. What I tell you what works really well for me that uh, I created this concept and I teach this to my own clients as well. It's uh, instead of you creating a vision or a mission statement for your business, I tell my clients to create an impact statement. So I want them to, to come up with a statement to clearly summarize and articulate what kind of impact, what kind of positive impact their business wants, to, you know, they want their business to have. So whether if it's uh, they want to make an industry better or maybe they want to serve customers better or they want to change our environment or anything like that. But clearly define what is your personal impact? Why is it important for you? And instead of reminding yourself about your mission and vision statements that nobody out there ever reads back once they have written, <laughs> use your impact statement as a human be being because when these things happen and you then go down this root cause analysis and then you reach that existential situation, you can then ask yourself, is this in line, is this why in line with my impact statement? If I do this, is it going to help me 
actually make that impact that I want to be making with this business? If the answer is no, you have to walk away. That's the easiest way for you to, to be you know, objective around the situation, yet still bring in your, your own personality that is not going to be influenced by your current emotional state. I'm sure there are other many methods out there as well. It's just something that I see that works quite easily because it's not that complex. And it's something that you can always pull out of the bag whenever it, it's, it's needed. I have uh, never written an impact statement, nor I've never even heard of one before, but I might try I to- I came up with it, that's why. <laughs> I might, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll try doing it at least once. I'll adopt that and, and we'll see how it goes. I'll keep you updated. It's exciting. And even like just coming up with your impact statement, it's, it's really fun as well. Like I tell you what my impact statement is, because that's how I help for me as well to understand where do I want to grow my business and even what kind of clients I, I want to be taking on because I've become already quite selective with who I work with, because now I realize that it's much better to, to work with the kind of people that you're really quick with. So my impact statement for my business is that my business actually empowers large crowds of change makers to make our world a better place. So it doesn't include the how, you know, it could be anything, but it, it clearly tells me that this is the direction I'm going and this is the kind of audience I am targeting. So I know why I'm doing it because if I can empower large crowds of change makers, that just makes our world a better place. It makes business a better place. It makes so many things a better place. So I might as well make a living out of doing something that fulfilling, so. I love it. I, I think it's great. This has been a fun conversation. I know, great. right? We could talk for another 10 hours probably. <laughs> but I, I, I like how that we deep dived into a few different parts and got a few different surprising new lessons out. And we even brought it back to the existential questions, uh, why, why it exists. Uh, yeah. but more important than coming up with the best practice for this, this, this or that. So, uh, so this is fun. And thank, thank you for coming to me. And everyone who's made it to the end, thank you for making it this far. I hope you had as much fun and you got as tipsy as we got as well. And thanks for having me. It was super fun to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.